You will observe that by reading a line of print with which you are not familiar, and which you have never seen before, and then closing your eyes, you can see that line as plainly as though you were looking at it on the printed page. In reality, you are looking at it, not on the printed page, but on the sensitized plate of your own mind. If you try this experiment and it does not work the first time, it is because you did not concentrate your attention on the line closely enough. Repeat the performance a few times, and finally you will succeed. If you wish to memorize poetry, for example, you can do so very quickly by training yourself to fix your attention on the lines so closely that you can shut your eyes and see them in your mind as plainly as you see them on the printed page. So important is this subject of control of attention that I feel impelled to emphasize it in such a way that you will not pass by it lightly. I have reserved reference to this important subject until the last, as a climax to this lesson, for the reason that I consider it by far the most important part of the lesson. The astounding results experienced by those who make a practice of crystal gazing are due entirely to their ability to fix attention upon a given subject for an unbroken period far beyond the ordinary. Crystal gazing is nothing but concentrated attention. I have already hinted at that which I will now state as my belief, namely that it is possible through the aid of concentrated attention, for one so to attune one's mind to the vibration of the ether that all the secrets in the world of unfathomed and uncharted mental phenomena may become as open books which may be read at will. What a thought this is to ponder over! I am of the opinion, and not without substantial evidence to support me, that it is possible for one to develop the ability of fixing the attention so highly that one may tune in and understand that which is in the mind of any person. But this is not all, nor is it the most important part of a hypothesis at which I have arrived after many years of careful research. For I am satisfied that one may just as easily go a step further and tune in on the universal mind in which all knowledge is stored where it may be appropriated by all who master the art of coming after it. To a highly orthodox mind, these statements may seem very irrational, but to the student, and so far there are but few people in the world who are more than mere students of an elementary grade of this subject, who has studied this subject with any appreciable degree of understanding, these hypotheses seem not only possible, but absolutely probable. But put the hypothesis to a test of your own. You can select no better subject upon which to try an experiment than that which you have selected as your definite chief aim in life. Memorize your definite chief aim so you can repeat it without looking at the written page. Then make a practice of fixing your attention on it at least twice a day, proceeding as follows. Go into some quiet place where you will not be disturbed. Sit down and completely relax your mind and your body. Then close your eyes and place your fingers in your ears, thereby excluding the ordinary sound waves and all of the light waves. In that position, repeat your definite chief aim in life, and as you do so, see yourself and your imagination in full possession of the object of that aim. If a part of your aim is the accumulation of money, as it undoubtedly is, then see yourself in possession of that money. If a part of the object of your definite aim is the ownership of a home, then see a picture of that home in your imagination, just as you expect to see it in reality. If a part of your definite aim is to become a powerful and influential public speaker, then see yourself before an enormous audience and feel yourself playing upon the emotions of that audience as a great violinist would play upon the strings of the violin. As you approach the end of this lesson, there are two things which you might do, viz. First, you might begin now to cultivate the ability to fix attention at will on a given subject with a feeling that this ability, when fully developed, would bring you the object of your definite chief aim in life. Or, second, you might tilt your nose in the air and with the smile of a cynic say to yourself, Bosh! and thereby mark yourself a fool. Take your choice. This lesson was not written as an argument, nor as the subject of a debate. It is your privilege to accept it, in whole or in part, or reject it, just as you please. But at this place I wish to state, however, that this is not an age of cynicism or doubt, an age that has conquered the air above us and the sea beneath us, that has enabled us to harness the air and turn it into a messenger that will carry the sound of our voice halfway around the earth in the fractional part of a second. Certainly, 
is not an age that lends encouragement to the doubting Thomases or the I don't believe it Joneses. The human family has passed through the Stone Age and the Iron Age and the Steel Age, and unless I have greatly misinterpreted the trend of the times, it is now entering the Mind Power Age, which will eclipse in stupendous achievement all the other ages combined. Learn to fix your attention on a given subject at will, for whatever length of time you choose, and you will have learned the secret passageway to power and plenty. This is concentration. You will understand from this lesson that the object of forming an alliance between two or more people and thereby creating a mastermind is to apply the law of concentration more effectively than it could be applied through the efforts of but one person. The principle referred to as the mastermind is nothing more nor less than group concentration of mind power upon the attainment of a definite object or end. Greater power comes through group mind concentration because of the stepping up process produced through the reaction of one mind upon another or others. Defeat, like a headache, warns us that something has gone wrong. If we are intelligent, we look for the cause and profit by the experience. Is it not strange that the word boomerang has been in the dictionary all these years without its having become generally known that a boomerang is an instrument which comes back and may wound the hand that throws it? Do you see that lucky fellow over there who holds a position through pull? Let me whisper a secret in your ear. Fate is standing in wait for him just around the corner with a stuffed club, and it is not stuffed with cotton. Fish don't bite just for the wishin'. Keep a pullin. Change your bait and keep on fishin. Keep a pullin. Luck ain't nailed to any spot. Men you envy like as not envy you your job and lot. Keep a pullin. Persuasion versus Force Success, as has been stated in dozens of different ways throughout this course, is very largely a matter of tactful and harmonious negotiation with other people. Generally speaking, the man who understands how to get people to do things he wants done may succeed in any calling. As a fitting climax for this lesson on the law of concentration, we shall describe the principles through which men are influenced, through which cooperation is gained, through which antagonism is eliminated and friendliness developed. Force sometimes gets what appear to be satisfactory results, but force alone never has built and never can build enduring success. The World War has done more than anything which has happened in the history of the world to show us the futility of force as a means of influencing the human mind. Without going into details or recounting the instances which could be cited, we all know that force was the foundation upon which German philosophy has been built during the past forty years. The doctrine that might makes right was given a worldwide trial, and it failed. The human body can be imprisoned or controlled by physical force, but it is not so with the human mind. No man on earth can control the mind of a normal, healthy person if that person chooses to exercise his God-given right to control his own mind. The majority of people do not exercise this right. They go through the world, thanks to our faulty educational system, without having discovered the strength which lies dormant in their own minds. Now and then something happens, more in the nature of an accident than anything else, which awakens a person and causes him to discover where his real strength lies, and how to use it in the development of industry or one of the professions. Result? A genius is born. There is a given point at which the human mind stops rising or exploring unless something out of the daily routine happens to push it over this obstacle. In some minds this point is very low, and in others it is very high. In still others, it varies between low and high. The individual who discovers a way to stimulate his mind artificially, arouse it and cause it to go beyond this average stopping point, frequently, is sure to be rewarded with fame and fortune if his efforts are of a constructive nature. The educator who discovers a way to stimulate any mind and cause it to rise above this average stopping point without any bad reactionary effects will confer a blessing on the human race second to none in the history of the world. We, of course, do not have reference to physical stimulants or narcotics. These will always arouse the mind for a time, but eventually they ruin it entirely. We have reference to a purely mental stimulant, such as that which comes through intense interest, desire, enthusiasm, love, etc., the factors out of which a mastermind may be developed. 
The person who makes this discovery will do much toward solving the crime problem. You can do almost anything with a person when you learn how to influence his mind. The mind may be likened to a great field. It is a very fertile field which always produces a crop after the kind of seed which is sown in it. The problem, then, is to learn how to select the right sort of seed, and how to sow that seed so that it takes root and grows quickly. We are sowing seed in our minds daily, hourly, nay, every second, but we are doing it promiscuously and more or less unconsciously. We must learn to do it after a carefully prepared plan, according to a well-laid-out design. Haphazardly sown seed in the human mind brings back a haphazard crop. There is no escape from this result. History is full of notable causes of men who have been transformed from law-abiding, peaceful, constructive citizens to roving, vicious criminals. We also have thousands of cases wherein men of the low, vicious, so-called criminal type have been transformed into constructive, law-abiding citizens. In every one of these cases, the transformation of the human being took place in the mind of the man. He created in his own mind, for one reason or another, a picture of what he desired, and then proceeded to transform that picture into reality. As a matter of fact, if a picture of any environment, condition, or thing be pictured in the human mind, and if the mind be focused or concentrated on that picture long enough and persistently enough, and backed up with a strong desire for the thing pictured, it is but a short step from the picture to the realization of it in physical or mental form.